Where else do you can get a group of people where you have two of the most important tech executives in the world, one of the best science fiction authors ever, and a really brilliant minister from Rwanda. You either get them at a Davos panel or a party at Mark Benioff's house. That's the only ways <laughs> you can possibly get this group of people together. I am delighted. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first off, I'll be taking questions through Slido. So please ask your questions in Slido if you're watching on the web stream. I've been told by WEF that they will remove certain questions. I'm super curious. What are the questions that they remove? So push the limits. I'll see them um, <laughs> as we go. Um, and we'll have a little wrap up at the end. But now, let me introduce our amazing, amazing panel. Starting on my left, Paula Ngubiri. She is the Minister of Tech and Innovation for Rwanda. Then we have Chris Cox. He is the CPO of Meta Platforms. We have Enrique Lores. He is the CEO of HP Inc. And we have Neil Stevenson, who wrote Snow Crash and so many other things and has done all kinds of wonderful work from describing the metaverse to helping to build it. Structure of this session, also helpful for questions. We'll do a little bit of definitional because you're legally obligated to do that when you host a panel on the metaverse. Then we'll talk about some of the work that each of them is doing. Then we'll talk about some of the foundational questions and how the metaverse gets built, some of the ethical questions, and we'll end with some big thoughts about where we're going. So let's get going. You have to describe and define the metaverse. I have the man who came up with the word first. So Neil, in 1992, what was the metaverse? How do you describe it now? I'd been doing some work on kind of an experimental art project that involved heavy use of three-dimensional graphics stuff, which was expensive and difficult to use at the time, and, but it obviously had promise. And so I was asking myself, um, what would it take to make that kind of hardware as cheap as television was today? How do we make, turn it from a kind of laboratory curiosity into a mass market? medium and the the idea that I came up with to answer that question was the metaverse um, and um, so as you say it was published in 92 um, <clears throat> and then the year the next year two things happened doom came out and um, the the web came out and both of those things as it turns out drove the cost of 3d graphics hardware down much more rapidly and effectively than I thought they would. So it really turned into something that was driven predominantly, I think, by the games industry, uh, as opposed to uh, my kind of TV-centric vision of it. And how do you find the metaverse now? When someone says, what is the metaverse, you say? Nascent. Nascent. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we've got a ways to, to go. Um, so um, the uh, it's really just in the last couple of years that Everything has come together. I mean, um, the, uh, the the cost of of, the, of the, the raw graphics processing power came down a lot, and that's how we get the video game industry. Um, but you need more than that um, to make. Uh, with that, you can make great games. You can make great three-dimensional experiences. But to network all of that stuff together into something that looks like the metaverse, you need, in addition, um, a lot of networking capability. You, you need an ability to handle transactions cheaply and quickly and reliably, um, and a lot of other elements that are kind of less obvious um, but um, haven't really uh, started to materialize until just the last couple of years. Enrique, how do you define the metaverse? I, I would say it's immersive. Mm -hmm. If we so think anything about that's immersive is the metaverse. Is, is the, the way to really make the web and access to content immersive? If we think about what has happened during the last years, we started with text, with text, we moved to images, we went to video. The next step is really to totally engage, totally get immersive experiences. This is what the metaverse so is. Is it device independent? Can I have an immersive experience with my phone and have it be the metaverse? To a certain extent, yes, but the user interface is, one, is what is going to make making the difference. If you think about when technology revolutions have happened, it has mostly been driven by when the user interface has totally changed, when the customer experience is designed in a way that customer really wants to engage and participate. This is what makes it special. I thought technological revolutions were normally driven by the porn industry, but we'll leave that aside for <laughs> a future Davos panel. I think that was on the list of inappropriate comments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for one. Chris, do you define it as Device dependent? Does the metaverse depend on using no. AR, VR? No. I don't think so. I mean, I would think about it as a ver like the next version of the internet that gets less flat. 
You know, the, the, the primary metaphor for the internet has been the web page since it was born. You know, we borrowed the language for describing designing the web page from typography and page layout, and we used thinking about pages to talk about and imagine what the internet is. And then the user interface has been a screen. Yeah. Um, the screen was on our desk, now it's in our pocket. I think computing brings interfaces closer to our senses, to our fingertips, mm -hmm. to our speech, to our ears. I think that's part of what we're talking about um, when we get into the metaverse is the internet unflattening and having experiences that feel more like physical experiences instead of video conferences and, and screen experiences. Paula? Well, I think I'd also go with the massive, but also really thinking about that space where imagination has no limits. And uh, just this afternoon, I did, I don't know how many of you in the audience have had the chance to go to the Global Collaboration Village for the experience that is there. And uh, my mind was blown away because I started to think, can this replace consultancies where I get a paper on a strategy, but rather give me tangible uh, results on what are some of the things that I want to do and how can I feel them before I actually get in the real world to mm -hmm. implement. Wow. All right. Well, I hope everybody does that experience. You can um, basically, it's Davos with no legs. It's very cool. <laughs> um, all right. So now I want to go around and I want to talk about, um, I want everybody to talk about the work, the work they're doing. Because and start, we'll start with Neil because it's actually it layers up very nicely the way this panel was was selected. Good job, Wef. Um, uh, the different layers of how the metaverse is being built. So Neil, you not only write these wonderful novels, but you've actually started a blockchain-based layer for the metaverse. Explain what it is, what you're doing, and how people are using it. Yeah, it's called Lamina One, and it um, it kind of emerges from the uh, uh, the observation that I've made over the last sort of 10 years of working with games and game technology in different ways is that um, if we're going to have a metaverse that's being used and enjoyed by millions and millions of people, then there are going to have to be experiences in the metaverse that are worth having. And um, the, the people who know how to create those kinds of experiences right now, by and large, work in the game industry. And you know, some of them work for great big AAA game studios. Um, some of them work for little scrappy indie companies. Some of them are even solo practitioners. But, um, but they're the ones who, whose talents are going to be needed to actually make a metaverse that people are going to want to visit. So what we're trying to do with the Lamina One project is to build a, a blockchain that is optimized specifically for those kinds of creators. There are a lot of people um, right now in the game industry trying to incorporate um, and not just games, but other kinds of immersive experiences, but I sort of harp on games. But they're, they're trying to incorporate uh, blockchain into what they're building because there's a big overlap between what those people need uh, to, to make money um, and what blockchain uh, is capable of, of providing. But right now, it's difficult and it's, uh, it's frequently a little scary. Um, so uh, the, the, what Lamina One is trying to do is, um, in its early days, and it's a kind of pure engineering project at this point, but we're, we're, we're building a chain that, um, that can bring the, the benefits of that kind of technology to as many builders as, as we can reach. So I, for example, if I were one of those builders, I would build an application into some metaverse system and underlying it identity and other things would be stored on your blockchain layer? Yeah, so identity is a good example of something uh, that that is kind of, if you think of a game, let's say you, uh, you you go on to World of Warcraft or Fortnite or whatever, you're you're logging onto their server, you, you prove that you know that you are who you say you are, and then you get access to your avatar, your inventory, all of the stuff that you've accumulated playing that game. That works fine as long as you're sticking to one game. But if you want to fluidly move from one experience to another, then it doesn't work anymore because you're constantly having to sort of log in, log out of one experience and log into another. So identity is one example of something that needs to be um, distributed and decentralized um, if the metaverse uh, is actually going to work. Um, and there's lots of other examples, like just the ability to, to carry things with you 
you know, if you've got, if your avatar is wearing certain things or carrying certain inventory items, um, you know, who created those items? How do they get paid? Uh, what happens when you try to carry them from one part of the metaverse to another? Uh, we think that um, there are blockchain-based solutions that can help solve those, those problems. All right. Chris, you want to explain um, what you're doing and why so many Australian plumbers are using your, uh, your, your devices? <laughs> um, yeah, so at Meadow, we're basically, um, it's been about eight years since we acquired Oculus. Oculus was a a small startup that had designed the first really good VR prototype. This was about eight years ago. John Carmack, who was the creator of Doom, which um, you mentioned earlier, was one of the engineers who helped build a VR headset that was uh, pretty wondrous when you put it on. So we basically acquired Oculus, and then we've spent the last eight years trying to productionize and improve um, VR to get to a VR product line that is affordable enough, usable enough, um, and impressive enough that it can be used in uh, social experiences, fitness, gaming, um, medicine, you're starting to see it used, uh, drug development, um, industrial design, you know, for sneakers and cars, uh, a piece of hardware that could be used to basically um, be used instead of a PC for things that wanted to be or were more naturally done in 3D. So we build a VR hardware line. We're working on um, augmented reality, which is a much farther out version of the future where you would wear you know, a nice pair of glasses like what many of you have on. It would be light, it would be comfortable, it would have waveguides that would allow you to see um, screens in front of you, your messages, the weather, you know, translating the menu in front of you. You'd have a cursor to control it you know, with your fingers. Uh, you could speak to it, et cetera. Um, we believe that one day that computing platform will be as important as the smartphone has become uh, in, in our lifetimes. And so we're working on a lot of the early R&D to bring that to life. So that's VR and AR. We're also working on software. Um, so Workrooms is an example of a piece of software we build to allow folks to have meetings in VR. Um, so you put on a headset, and rather than a Zoom call or a, a, a Skype meeting, you could get together and actually have the experience of being together in a room. Um, it's an avatar who's rendered as your body, but you have spatial audio, and you can see body movements, and you can see hand gestures. So rather than sort of seeing faces arrayed in a screen in front of you, you have a feeling of presence. And we view the feeling of presence as being the essential ingredient for the user experience of something that feels metaverse-like. And Workrooms, for us, has been the killer app of something that is a really meaningful reason to put something on in a work context, uh, to put a headset on in a work context. Uh, so we're trying to build some of this software, and we're also trying to support a developer ecosystem of developers, again, across categories, including medicine, including education, including uh, filmmakers who are starting to make 3D content, um, really just trying to start to seed the ecosystem of content and experiences for VR. Um, and you do have a lot of Australian plumbers training there. Enrique. Mm -hmm. um, That's news to me. Um, <laughs> um, Enrique, you have, um, you build a lot of services like business services in the metaverse. The coolest one that I read about is you're either working on or have already developed the ability to 3D print an object that's designed in the metaverse. Will you explain how that works and where you think that will go? Sure. <clears throat> Part of, of what we do in the company is really translate digital concepts into physical concepts. This is what we have been doing with printing for a long time, where we go from a digital photography into a paper photography. The same concept can be applied to print and to create physical objects. When you we have engineers designing in the metaverse physical parts, we can translate them and create a physical object. And this is something that we have started to do and for which we already have some applications. And this is especially relevant when the part, is unique, the part is unique and has been designed for a specific person. So for example, the, the case I, I brought here today is for gaming. These are personalized gaming keyboards where the gamer can design the type of keyboard he wants to use or she wants to use. And we can print that, and then we send it, and he will be or she will be configuring her own keyboard. Things like that we can do with almost any object, almost in any type of material. Wow. Paula, how, are, how is it being used the most in Rwanda? 
So I think for us, and um, it's really everything that we hear here is how do we create an enabling environment uh, for that to all happen. Uh, so whether it's um, some of the policies we are putting in place uh, around, you know, deploying 5G infrastructure, we've had about uh, the limitations around uh, most 5G use cases. And I think with the metaverse, you have a perfect uh, use case on, on when a country or you know, partners are deploying uh, 5G. And so for us, it's really looking at what are those foundations for this to happen, whether it's uh, building high-speed broadband networks and, and making sure that they're accessible, affordable, and available for everyone. And then the second bit is around talent. Uh, and so these are linked back to whether it com it's companies like Meta or it's startups that are building uh, some of these use case applications and just creating the right talent that is going to build solutions that respond uh, to those specific challenges or socioeconomic challenges that we are trying to solve for. And what is your vision of how the, meta or the role the metaverse will play in Rwanda? You'll have, you want to, you see the metaverse as the next great platform and so you want lots of Rwandan companies building tools, you see it as a use case and you want, you, you understand it's going to be the next big platforms, you are wants them to be using it. How do you, what is your vision? I think there are particular industries that you can, we, we're already mapping out. So there's, there's the tourism industry, the creative industry. There's also education. We're talking about um, immersive education experiences. I think earlier, as we were getting ready for this panel, we were just discussing whether it's in the medical field, how do you yeah. provide that opportunity for those hands-on skills even before, where people can simulate or learn before they can get in the real world. Right. And so these are some of those particular uh, industries or use cases that we're already mapping out and figuring out what's important, which brings me uh, to the uh, last part of what are those foundations, which is data, the policies that need to be in place, uh, whether it's around the availability and collection of data, the privacy laws around that, which are very important if you're really mm -hmm. going to simulate some of uh, these experiences. Um, but very particularly, I think what we want to do as a government, even as public sector, is can we also walk the talk? We've talked about data-driven policymaking. What does it mean when we're thinking about metaverse use case applications? And when I did talk about consultancy, I wasn't joking because mm -hmm. while we've used data models to sort of predict some of the policy interventions that we want uh, to create, but sometimes it's also useful if you can simulate the impact of these policy interventions and you think it gives more clarity and more confidence in wh how you're going to push some of the public investments. Excellent. I will say that we've had, actually, this panel has already led to something good in the green room. I asked, I asked, I asked Paula what headsets they were using in Rwanda, and she said, well, they, we weren't using Oculus. And Chris, why, why not? He said, we don't have the permits. And she says, I do the permits. So, um, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> so, anybody who's invested in Meta stock, it's going to shoot up because the sale's in Rwanda soon. So, let's talk to some of the technological questions because they're so interesting, right? It's this, like, right now, if you're talking about VR, obviously AR is better. But where we're dealing with right now, it's a, like a relatively heavy thing for the most part on your head. There's a battery, there's heat, and you may be tethered, you may not be tethered. There are all kinds of complex things, right? And many people have been in the metaverse. You maybe feel a little nauseous, though apparently nobody has thrown up at WEF at the demo yet. You may feel a little nauseous when you do it. There's so many interesting things that we're trying to solve. So maybe Enrique or Chris or Neil uh, want to jump in and say something yeah, I'm going Fascinating. To, I'm going That's to jump be in and, and, and disagree with you. Excellent. I, I, I think that that the way uh, that billions of people around the world are interacting with fully immersive 3D environments today using 2D mm -hmm. uh, screens. Ah, I see. Okay. And um, uh, you wouldn't think that would work because, I mean, we're we're literally using the WASD keys on a, a Victorian typewriter keyboard in order to move around uh, in these spaces. Um, and yet the brain is incredibly good at making us believe that we're actually in that space. And that's the basis of the game industry. So I, I, it's gonna be both. Mm -hmm. Like the headsets are definitely coming on, both VR and AR, and they're getting a lot better. But, but don't discount the, Im yeah. the importance yeah. of, uh, of interacting with uh, the metaverse through a, a two-dimensional rectangle. Good. I think it's go all going to depend on what is the use case and the application. Mm -hmm. There are applications where with some of the 2D technologies it's going to be perfectly fine. And if we think about how design has been done for many years, designers have been designing 3D parts using 2D technologies and has worked. And for other technologies, maybe in education, as some of the examples you were bringing before, a more immersive technology really will make a difference. And there are going to be multiple different type of applications and technologies that will develop for, for each. Mm -hmm.
Chris, what's the hardest thing you're most interesting thing you're trying to yeah, solve? Yeah, I mean, one right thing I mentioned to you previously on this is um, concurrency is an interesting problem we're running up against. So, if you want like a comedy club experience, is one of the is one of the experiences we've been playing around with, which is like a comedy club is not just about watching the the comedian; it's about hearing the audience mm -hmm. laugh and interacting with the audience. It's it's a very group experience, a comedy club. So we've been trying to to try and figure out if comedy could work in the metaverse. And it turns out a comedy club with 18 people in it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. You want a little bit bigger of a room. You want a room of around this size so you can hear the murmur and the roar, mm -hmm. a, a, like a, a big chuckle laugh. And you can hear whispers. And you can hear sort of people around you. If you want that to work, you need high concurrency. So you need lots of different people, who all of whose avatars are being rendered in a headset that's sitting in front of your face where their movements were communicated over the internet. None of it can be pre-rendered. It all needs to be pretty accurate in timing so that if you're gesturing or responding to a joke or a movement, I'm getting it you know, in less than a handful of, of milliseconds. Um, and that trades off against how high resolution the experience is. Mm -hmm. So if you ever ask, like, well, why isn't the metaverse like super high resolution yet? Well, the answer is, if you want really high resolution, you need to trade off against concurrency. If you want high concurrency, you need to trade off against latency. So we're running up against basically the computer processor and having to start to understand the trade-off space of which of those things in which context is most important. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit nerdy, but I think it paints a picture of. But is that a problem that inevitably gets solved? As Processors become faster, batteries become more efficient, everything starts to work better. Is it a, Moore's, a problem that can be solved with Moore's Law? Yeah, I mean, it will be helped by Moore's Law. Um, you also have the, the form factor problem, which is the computer needs to, uh, gives off heat. And because the computer is not sitting there with a fan in front of it and is not inside of a device that has cooling, um, you have some physical constraints there that, that Moore's Law doesn't get you outside of. Um, but that's just a way of saying we're in the very early version, like the Xerox Park stages of the hardware, where we're starting to try and figure out how to get around some of the technical constraints. But we're also learning about which of these things is most important for the user experience. Mm -hmm. and what did you it's not only the processing power, it's also the ability to upload and download information fast enough from the cloud. Right. This is another big limitation that as Chris was saying, is really limiting what how many things can be done. Which at the is same why time. you need great 5G infrastructure in Rwanda. <laughs> Everywhere. Um, so I have a question so that's coming from someone who works in this space, probably 25 years ago, an engineer who who said a remark that stuck with me, which is the speed of light sucks, <laughs> <laughs> and and because ultimately, no matter how fast you make everything work. Yes. You've still got to transmit all of this at less than the, the speed of light. And so that's kind of the ultimate ceiling on, on how fast this stuff can work. But beneath that ceiling, there's all kinds of clever things you can do to make it seem like it's faster. Yeah. I mean, and this, this gets it to me, one of the most interesting big questions about the metaverse, which is, is it like mobile, where it's like a whole platform world where everything happens, or is it like video games, which are a discrete, amazing thing, but some people use and some people don't, right? And so does it become a universal layer of our life, or is it discrete in particular, and maybe awesome, maybe not, and you use it for some things, or maybe you don't? It seems like all of you are saying it's going to become a universal platform, which kind of suggests that these problems will be solved pretty well, and they're not fundamental problems. Is that a fair way of looking at it? I think we hope so. I just think it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. um, I think the internet's a pretty good way to think about the metaverse because the internet, some parts of the internet are very coherent with each other. If you're inside of Wikipedia, if you're inside of Instagram, you know, these are experiences that are self-consistent, that have a single designer, that have a single server, um, that have a single privacy and identity model where you understand the rules in those systems. Those systems are interlinked, so you can move from Instagram easily to Google Maps. You're not confused how you got there. You know, the link, the hyperlink, was the thing that got you there. And I think part of what doesn't exist yet for the metaverse is what is the hyperlink? Mm -hmm. What is the model of travel from sort of one set of experiences for the other? What, what identity comes with you? Does your inventory come with you, to use Neil's example? Are you inhabited by the same person you were in the fitness experience when you go to the 
to the work experience, probably you want to change clothes at least. <laughs> um, and these are just some of the, sort of the, the, the examples of what we don't know yet when we talk about one big amorphous thing versus lots of different subdivided things is there's going to be some coherence and connectivity between them. Well, and that's the, you know, that's the, that's why it's so interesting and why I love having this panel because at some point we're going to figure out what the hyperlink is, right? Or we're going to figure out whether your identity goes with you. And it'll be maybe a decision made by a company, maybe kind of a collective decision, but then we'll have huge consequences down the line, right? Neil, what to you is the most interesting open question about how the metaverse develops? It's who's going to develop it? Um, is it going to be, um, it's sort of the decentralized, bottom-up, organic growth model versus the centralized, top-down approach. And each has its advantages. Um, and um, uh, in, in my way of thinking, um, just it doesn't happen unless you uh, create uh, an open system that's kind of analogous to the early web or the early internet where uh, anyone who's interested can latch on to a, a shared protocol and begin to, to build what they want to build mm -hmm. in that world. And you know, a lot of what people build is, is going to go nowhere, but, but some of it is going to be uh, taken up and, um, and embraced and used by, by large numbers of people. Um, so we have to figure out a way to make sure that when that happens, the people who created it um, don't get screwed and get paid uh, and recognized for the contributions that they've, they've made. Well, so can you give some advice to Chris? Chris is a top-down company, a big, important, valuable company building out this. What should he be doing to match this vision, or is it impossible for a large centralized company like Facebook, to, like Meta, to do that? Uh, I don't know enough about the internals of that company to... Uh, You've got one of the most powerful people right here. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm not sure how much uh, he's uh, empowered or willing to, to divulge in the way of uh, proprietary uh, data about those, those plans. But um, right now, the, the image that one has of Facebook and other big social media companies is very much that of a centralized, you know top-down-ish kind of organization, is that, I mean, to what extent is that um, kind of coded into the, the DNA of, of what you guys are trying to build? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing about the, at least the development of Facebook and Instagram is a lot of it is focused on giving tools to creators and tools to businesses. I mean, the content you see on Instagram is not content that we created. It's content built by tools from people, from businesses. Um, the creative tools that we give them is a lot of what makes the experience unique, along with some set of assurances around safety and privacy, which is where the centrality can offer a big benefit to the user. I think with the metaverse, we're probably going to see spaces that are self-consistent, oftentimes offered by big companies. We're going to see spaces that are built by, you know, startups and shops. Um, I think how those interoperate is the most important conversation for making sure that we don't sort of accidentally um, sort of step on each other's toes. Well, Enrique, maybe you can take a crack at this. From your perspective, would you rather there was kind of a core layer of the metaverse with one big company that sets the rules, keeps everybody safe, a little bit like iPhone and iOS, in which we all put apps and you could sell your software, or would you prefer it would be more like Android, right, where there's a layer with far fewer rules. You can put on what you want, and lots of different companies doing the hardware. Or would you rather it be completely open? What's better for your business? Which which of the models of future meta metaverses, metaversi, would you prefer? <laughs> for for our business, a more open metaverse is better. It will allow us wow. to give provide more value. To but then you have to build in a whole bunch of different, you know form factors and frameworks and all that, that's still better. Yes, because it huh. all depends about control points. If someone controls the full metaverse, the ability to add value is much smaller. And yeah. we have seen this in other parts of the technology uh, world. Interesting. And this makes, a, this makes a big difference. Super interesting. What Paul. will be very important, though, is that no matter what, how many metaverses we have, there is a common layer of privacy and security that all of us can build from. And when we're talking about key enablers, this is one of the key enablers to make sure that this can be used in a secure way where also 
consumers can be sure that their privacy is protected. That's a very important technology section that needs to be developed. Super duper interesting. Paula? I would also agree with an open model because you're also talking about building capabilities across the board and also understanding that perhaps a one size fits all may not just work and the same way we're going to be trying to figure out the different use case applications that may be unique to every country, to every region, to every part of the world. So the more you make it open, the more you empower more and more people that can build applications uh, for the metaverse. So Chris, let's talk a little bit about how exactly meta is building out. So explain the degree to which your I mean, they're hold, I guess, I, to the degree to which you're building hardware that can be used in multiple metaverses built by other people, to the degree that you're building software uh, that can work on other people's hardware and to which other people can add apps, and to the extent that you're dealing with identity. Of these three different vectors, which is the most important to you and where is Meta going? Yeah, I mean, so for Meta, the most important is to build experiences for people connecting and, and doing stuff together. I mean, that's sort of the mission of the company, that's the company's heritage. You know, what does the living room look like? What does the, what does the conference look like between friends? You know, what does a phone call look like? You know, those are, if you just look at what we do, you know, with 80% of the company's investment, you know, it's WhatsApp, it's Instagram, it's Facebook, it's Messenger, it's those sorts of experiences. So from a pure mission perspective, that's to us the most interesting question. Um, we're developing the hardware and the operating systems just because they don't exist. I mean, this stuff doesn't exist in the world. We want to see them yeah. come into existence. Um, we didn't set out to be a hardware company when we were born. Um, but as it turns out, if you want to start to bring some of these experiences to life, sometimes you need to build the hardware. And you need to do the research, and you need to think about operating systems. Um, but it's all completely open. I mean, if you look at our top apps, you're seeing game developers, you're seeing social experiences, you're seeing messaging experiences, you're seeing education, some of the stuff we've talked about being built from companies around the world. Um, and we want to be a platform that's open to everybody. And um, that's part of being a, a hardware platform that consumers want to use. Let's talk a little bit. This is such a fascinating debate. I love that we just had those last few minutes. I thought it was brilliant, interesting, and degree I'd never, I'd never heard before. Let's talk for a minute about some of the rules that we'll have to make inside the metaverse because we got a lot wrong. I think everybody can agree. We got a lot wrong in Web 2. And there are going to be all kinds of issues. I was just thinking when, you know, the, the new devices, you can track someone's gaze, right? That's great for a meeting, right? But you could tell whether someone's gay or straight in like 30 seconds if you knew exactly where their eyes were going, right? So the amount of information that you'll have because of how tight these sensors are and these systems are is phenomenal. So what are the most important rules? Anybody can answer this question. What are the most important rules to get right as we move forward? I think one of them is, is going to be to, to make sure that the information that is shared about myself is the information that I decide to share. And when Chris was saying, I, there is different information I want to share when I'm gaming at home versus when I am in the office, I need to be able to make that choice yeah. to make sure that my information is protected. That's a very important rule and very hard to develop. So it's something that is going to require a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Neil, is that something? Is that, that sounds like one of the foundational questions you're trying to solve on your blockchain layer. Well, the, we had to think about this a lot at, at Magic Leap um, for the reason you mentioned, which is that uh, there's a whole sensor package that uh, is going to learn a lot of, about you. And um, the, um, to make a long story short, I, I think this is a really prosaic answer, but I think it's a a UX problem, a, a user interface design problem. I was thinking about this this morning when some warning came up on my iPhone that um, I can't even remember what it was, but it was one of these like vague security warnings, you know, and I was trying to track it down. I'm Googling, you know, who else has gotten this warning lately? And I get a list of, um, of, of people going back like 10 years, um, most of that information is obsolete. Um, so I'm left in a state of kind of low-lying dread and anxiety. Um, <laughs> and it's probably not based on any real security threat. It's based on bad UX, uh, which is um, uh, not giving me the answers I need and not really giving me a transparent view of what, which of my data is being uh, is being exposed on the, the internet and, and what isn't. Um, and so um, um, 
just the, the more complicated these devices and these systems get, the, the harder those problems become. And um, you know, just having a, a, a screen where you can check a few boxes isn't good enough uh, anymore. We're, as these things get even more complicated and harvest all kinds of additional data, we're going to need better uh, ways to know what's being shared, who's being shared with, and how to control, uh, how to know that, and how to, to control it. I think, I think in addition to the um, data sharing frameworks, already even in, as it is today, it's already complex. And so if you think about it in the metaverse, I think it gets even more complicated. But I think to add on to um, uh, what the rest are saying, there's also the privacy aspect. And even the way you simplify consent, uh, what data am I giving, for which experience, and for where. Because I think even today, when we look at some of the data protection and privacy laws that are in place, and the way they are being implemented, whether it's uh, within banks or insurance companies or wherever it is, it's very complex. You have a very long 24-page consent form that no one wants to read because in that point in time, they really need a service. And so all they'll do is just to check a box. So how do we simplify it so that people are more comfortable and they understand it's not just about the risks, but also they're comfortable with what they are putting out there. Then the other one I'd like to add is around interoperability because at the end of the day, back to UX and the user experience, you don't want to have siloed use cases where I'm going to be punching in the same data points for almost everything that I want to do in the metaverse. And so how do we make it interoperable, but at the same time uh, cater for these data sharing uh, nuances that will exist in the metaverse? So we need a fully interoperable, totally open multiverse. It's easy to say. That would be great. I think the devil is in the details. What about truth, right? One of the things we, you know, everybody's been talking about ChatGPT and large language models, and one of the obvious implications for the metaverse is that you're going to have fake characters that look mm -hmm. pretty human and you have emotional connection to, you talk to, say all kinds of shit, and you're not going to know whether it's a real person or whether it's general, and they'll be easy to make. How, Chris, how are we going to solve that? Yeah, I mean, I think you'll probably have different spaces with different rules. Uh huh. Um, so if you think about the software on your phone, like in some contexts, you expect in, you know, I'm in a company context, I can trust that people are who they say they are, um, or I'm out on the open internet and the rules are different. I mean, yeah. my expectations are different, what I share is different. Um, I use a, a pseudonym in some cases. Mm -hmm. And if you just what look at- What's use? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> How open are we going to get? <laughs> um, and that's probably, I think, how this will play out. And I think the key thing to make this work is you know what space you're in, and you're never confused about the context. Yeah. So you know if you're in a private thread that's encrypted, mm -hmm. you know you can share whatever you want. You know the person who's operating that service has certified and has has sort of made the contract with you that that's encrypted and it won't be shared, all the way to a completely open experience. You know people learn quickly and can make judgments when the context is consistent and when sort of the signposts are clear. Yeah. I think for new experiences is where you really want to be, you really want to over communicate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we want to think about some of these experiences um, on the metaverse is like being really transparent and clear and offering a lot of controls, yeah. you know, as people come into experiences to sort of tread gently um, into anything that's new. Enrique and Neil, does that sound right to you? Yes, and, and a debate we were having this morning in, in another session is, do we self-regulate ourselves and come together with a certain set of values that we all agree that we are going to follow, or will government, governments have to regulate? I think that's going to be a big debate over the coming years, and I think most of us are on the, first, on the camp of the first side, how do we self-regulate ourselves, but we should learn from the mistakes that we have made yeah. today, so we don't make them again because the danger is much, much higher. I'm, I'm just going to wave vaguely in the direction of zero knowledge proofs, which is heavy crypto research area that um, is sort of impossible to ex explain uh, in our five minutes and 52 seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, um, but people in this room or people who are watching this might want to kind of uh, keep an eye on uh, developments in that space because, at least in theory, it offers a way to attack some of these problems. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a way to uh, cryptographically divulge some information in a, a provable way, but not all of your information. And if you use it right, 
um, I think it could be a layer in solving some of the, the problems that we're talking about. Fascinating. All right, well, we have, as Neil said, five minutes left. So let's talk about where we see this going in the next five years or 10 years. Why don't you give your most optimistic scenario for how this improves value for humans? Paula, do you want to start? I think I see, and particularly if I look at Africa, I see a lot of potential when we're thinking about healthcare mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, in terms of how we provide more uh, targeted precision um, uh, medical interventions. So there's a lot of uh, potential right there. Uh, but also, even just thinking about the demographics of the African population, where you, a lot of them, you know, are in the youth <laughs> bracket, what you see is also the creative industry having a lot of potential in terms of how it can transform that, but also how it creates value uh, for for many of our youth. And I think we've seen so many statistics around what the potential looks like. Uh, what is key is how do we provide those foundations that are critical uh, mm -hmm. to making sure that as a continent we don't remain behind right. in this revolution. And so you can play a crucial role in making it. One of the things we learned from Web2 is the exactly. more people are involved in making it, the better it is. Yeah. Chris? 10 years. Well, you can, yeah, let's do 10. <laughs> 10. I mean, for me, I, it's something as simple as just taking a walk with an old friend or, you know, your parents in Chicago, my parents in Chicago, just like actually having them there in front of you instead of making that call. Mm -hmm. Having experiences like that, to me, if you, look at, if you look at the most important experiences you have on your phone, a lot of them are the basics mm -hmm. of just like reliable, good communication with the people you care about. I think bringing those into some more physical experiences is going to be powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something, obviously, there's many steps between here and there. You go for a walk, you walk down the promenade, your parents are with you on the promenade, or you're, you're both... You're sort of just, you're both out walking wherever you're walking and you're in some shared space. There. Oh, I'm imagining you're taking a walk wherever you actually are in real life. And instead of the video conference, you have somebody there with you who's alongside you. Mm -hmm. Or we could go for a run together, Nick. Be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Enrique? I think there are going to be tremendous changes in many of the key things that we do today from education, as Paula was saying, communication, providing medicine or access to medicine to remote locations. All of these experiences are going to be transformed. On the other side, what we don't know today yet is what is going to be the impact on the society of all these changes. Yeah. In the same way, Web2 is having still a lot of implications in how kids communicate. What are going to be the implications of these new experiences? I think it's something we'll have to learn. Neil? I'm looking forward to being surprised. I think anything I can sit here and predict is going to be outstripped by, um, by, by new kinds of creativity that are going to begin showing up. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so to that point, um, a lot of times it seems like the internet and the web are just like a big machine for finding incredibly ingenious ways to screw artists. And um, the, uh, uh, just when I thought we had sort of turned the corner, the whole uh, uh, the, the AI art thing uh, uh, appeared. I saw just yesterday Getty Images is, uh, is filing a big lawsuit um, to uh, 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 prevent the further use of its image library from, um, uh, by those kinds of, of programs. So, um, <clears throat> so what I'm hoping is that um, we can uh, we can find a way to um, uh, to support the people who who are needed to do the creative work uh, that'll surprise us all and and create a metaverse that, uh, as I said, millions of people will want to visit and spend time in. Well, let me ask you a question on this. So you say anything you imagine will be outstripped by our reality, but it's also the case that you imagine the reality we were in 30 years before most of us did. So tell me something that you're thinking about, not metaverse related, but a change to the world that you're seeing coming through tech or that you imagine that might come. So we're no longer talking about the metaverse. We're talking about everything. Talking about everything. You've got one minute to give us everything, Neil. We've got you on stage. We need the answer. Um, in order for everyone to not die, we have to remove carbon from the atmosphere on a scale that is completely mind-boggling, even to people who consider themselves really well-informed about this issue. And that's going to be the biggest engineering project in the history of the world. And I think we'll do it and we'll succeed. Um, but. Um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a big adventure, um, 
and um, it's it's going to be it's going to lead to mind-boggling uh, results. Uh, I hope, not plastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you to this fabulous panel. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to everybody for watching online. I learned a ton. I would like to, before I wrap, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Kathy, who has a few things to say. Where is she? Right. There we are. All right, thanks everyone. First of all, a big thank you to our amazing moderator, Nick Thompson, and wonderful panelists, Paula, Chris, uh, Enrique, and Neil. Um, my name is Kathy Lee. I head the media entertainment and sport platform at the forum, which houses the Defining and Building the Metaverse initiative that this panel is uh, associated with. So we want you to know we're not just talking about it, we're actually doing things. So we launched the initiative back in May last year with the goal of advancing, of advancing um, consensus Consensus among uh, diverse stakeholders uh, and focus on, you know, two tracks. One is uh, metaverse governance, and the other one is uh, economic and uh, social value creation. Uh, and today, actually, we just published the first outputs by the community uh, that focused on interoperability in the metaverse, which this panel discussed a lot about, and also uh, consumer uh, metaverse applications. And the work will continue to explore um, industrial and and. Uh, enterprise metaverses, uh, privacy, security, safety, uh, identity, among other issues. So the last thing I wanted to say is the metaverse will present significant challenges, but at the same time, it could be used for immense good as well, especially when driven by purposeful and ethical public-private uh, uh, partnerships. So if you're interested, please do come and talk to us and um, enjoy the rest of your time in Davos. Thank you Thank again. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. That was so much fun. Yeah.